Good afternoon, Sue. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate your time. Certainly. Welcome to my living room. <laughs> and, and all of ours. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we asked Sue to join us today. She's the uh, Chief, Chief Performance Officer in the uh, Agency Administration. And uh, she, is work, she works with the Government Accountability Committee. And um, I think we'd like to learn your role and right. your thoughts. Certainly. So welcome. Thank you. So for the record, my name is Sue Zeller, Susan Zeller, and I'm the state's first chief performance officer. Um, and so I've been here for 15 years. And the first uh, half of that, I was the deputy commissioner of finance, uh, working for Jim Reardon for eight years. And subsequently, I've been the chief performance officer. And I do, I actually sit non-voting member on the government accountability committee as the governor's um, representative. So what I thought I'd do is I'd walk you through what um, the Government Accountability Committee has been up to and how that intersects with my role as Chief Performance Officer. So I have a presentation that I'd like to do and feel free at any time. Um, we don't have to wait till the end for questions. If you have any questions, just let me know. Great, so great. let's see if I can get this thing up. Uh, oh, wait. I'm not as good on Zoom as I am on... Uh, Teams, teams, because uh, <laughs> the administration we use teams more than Zoom. So, let me know if you can see this. We can. All right, good. Well, that's a good sign. Come on. Okay. Come on. Do you mind putting it in the presenter mode? We had this with another presenter before. Is that possible? Um, presenter mode. You want me to get out? Perfect. Oh, no, that's, no, that's that's it. You did it. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Right. So. Um, here we go. So how did we get here? Um, so in, in the 1990s, Con Hogan, who was Secretary of the Agency of Human Services, brought RBA, <clears throat> which is Results-Based Accountability, into AHS. And they began using it and having a program. And they were doing um, all of uh, their um, county uh, trends and looking at uh, programmatic outcomes at a vastly large high level, but he introduced the concept and that program lasted um, until the 2009-2010 recession, Great Recession and it, uh, that job was eliminated. When Secretary Racine started, he uh, brought back RBA and he dedicated two staff members to it, which was uh, great. And, uh, in 2013, Commissioner David Mears brought LEAN into DEC, the Department of Environmental Com Conservation, and then AOT picked up on it. So in October of that year, I was appointed as Chief Performance Officer, but I'd been involved in a lot of this um, uh, efforts for efficiency and modernization I think I come by that genetically. My father was what you call a manufacturing efficiency expert. So uh, I can hear him always saying, Susan, there's got to be a system. So, uh, and the reason why my position of CPO was created was actually in preparation for what we knew the legislature was going to pass the following uh, session, 2014 session within an effort led by then Senator uh, Diane Snelling to, for the legislature to adopt RBA. And as part of that, uh, GAC was established and uh, had been established and they got to work on setting statewide population level outcomes and indicators to be used um, to, for me as a CPO to report. So how that um, process went along like that um, for a couple of years until Governor Scott came in. And Governor Scott really wanted to uh, create a, a full-blown system that used both lean and RBA. Um, originally, he just wanted to use lean because as a construction guy, he knows about that. But I convinced him and I said, look, 
the legislatures adopted um, another methodology and lean and RBA and Six Sigma and Baldridge and every other improvement methodology you can think of are all the same. Their goal is to improve or to be able to evaluate results or outcomes. So I saw a way that we could do both, that we could use lean at sort of a lower level when you're talking about making a process more efficient, like how many hands touch that same piece of paper, that expense report or that timesheet or that uh, contract that has to get signed. How do you make that efficient, make processes efficient or communications with vendors or clients or whatever. So we could use lean because lean is more directed at transactional processes. And we could use that at that level. And then we could flow up into results-based accountability and the overall outcomes. And we called this, the governor called it pivot, and I won't go there, but we called it continuous improvement, because that is really what we're trying to do is continuously improve our processes, our tasks, our technology, our programs, the results of our programs, and the overall outcomes that we want for Vermonters. We built um, with Governor Scott's uh, support an entire course structure for continuous improvement. And we have um, almost 2000 state employees that have gone through our programs at, at either the basic, intermediate or advanced level. We also tied in a strategic plan that the governor did for the administration, for the executive branch. And we tied those, his top level strategic outcomes into the 10 outcomes set by the legislature. We had a little, we hit a little bump in the road called, oh, I think you guys know what this thing is, COVID-19 around March of last year. And we had to reinvent our whole course structure to be able to do it um, remotely. And in, in a strange way, we've actually benefited from that because more employees um, can get approval to take the classes because they don't have to travel. So their supervisors are more willing to let them have, you know, two hours is two hours. It's not four hours anymore because they don't have to travel to Montpelier. So we're very pleased with that. So where are we right now? Well, GAC right now is working on selecting with stakeholder and public input indicators that will be used um, to look at our 10 outcomes from the uh, perception or from the demographic of uh, for racial equity of the uh, black indigenous and people of color perspective. That's being led by uh, Susanna Davis, our director of, of equity, myself and Drew Resley from um, AHS and uh, Emily, representative Emily Kornheiser and coach Christie. So uh, in addition, in my shop, we have a planned expansion of what we call the programmatic performance measure budget. Ultimately, what we're trying to get to is where each program, it probably of a certain size, I don't think we could, I don't think we have the staffing, the data or the wherewithal to produce um, metrics on every single program we have and publish them all. But we're going to, try to take our largest or most impactful programs and present them not only um, on a basis of what are they achieving and what are the results, but also how much of an investment are we making? And we're trying to do it beyond just the direct program costs. We're trying to incorporate indirect and overhead costs. So how does um, all of this stuff look. So here's a holistic look at the whole continuous improvement project, lean, RBA, everything. This is how we look at it. You know, this is the peel the onion thing. If you start at the outside, 
the highest level are the outcomes. And for that, we use the methodology and the language of RBA. So you have an outcome which you want. For example, we have 10 outcomes set in statute and they are things like Vermont has a prosperous economy, which is the one that I think you'd be most interested in. The second one is Vermonters are healthy. The third one is Vermont has a clean and sustainable um, uh, environment. So that's your ultimate outcome. Great, that's wonderful. How do we know if we have a prosperous economy? We use indicators and indicators are metrics that can somehow give you information about the economy. In most of these outcomes, there is no one formula metric analysis that you can do. So for Vermonters are healthy, there is no one percentage I can give you for how many Vermonters are healthy. But what I can do is I can tell you things like smoking rate, um, premature baby birth, how many people have health insurance. So those are proxy indicators that give you an idea as to how you're doing in the overall outcome that you're trying to achieve. And in the case of the economy, we look at unemployment. We look at um, the median wage. We look at uh, house prices, things like that, that tell us how we're doing. Now, below that level is something that we have invented that um, we've created a level here called a service domain. And a service domain are sort of a big bucket where you can put all of your like kind uh, areas in. So for example, you might have all nutrition programs. And in that you would be able to cluster WIC and Three Squares Vermont and um, in the case of COVID right now, our emergency food distribution or housing. You could look at housing and you could look at all the different housing programs we have. Currently, our appropriation system and our accounting system are in silos. Your analysis can go up and down the silo. You can go up and down human services and you can go up and down um, uh, uh, the ACCD, but if you want to look at housing, you can't go across. You cannot look at housing and drill across the three or four areas where housing is, because housing is in human services. Housing is in ACCD. Okay, housing is in the Housing and Conservation Board. So we have no way except manually to go across. So that's the purpose of service domains is we're trying in a longer term to be able to do that. For example, a few years ago, three years ago, maybe four, um, the governor uh, proposed and the legislature approved a $35 million bond for improving affordable housing. At the time, someone asked, you know, what are the reporters or something, what percentage of our overall housing investments did this $35 million uh, uh, you know, what's, what's its ratio to, you know, we're re is this a 10% investment? Of a well, we couldn't actually answer that question because housing programs are all over the place. And some departments in their programs, they charge actual employee salaries there. Some charge salaries all in administration and don't distribute the cost. So service domains is a coming feature. <clears throat> Below that, we have our strategic plan, which is where the administration gets down to brass tacks. And the governor has um, uh, three, uh, four primary strategic outcomes that he has. And each governor is going to have strategic outcomes of their own, depending upon their, um, their philosophy depending upon the times, you know, um, whether you've got economic challenges or whether you're, you want to do uh, a lot of things in education or the environment. But what I tried to enforce and what I think we did, and I would hope that future administrations follow this, 
we tied these outcomes directly to the 10 outcomes that the legislature already has established. So the governor's number one outcome is Vermont has a prosperous economy. Now he would tell you, <laughs> and I would tell you that that ties into Vermont has, um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the legislative one is Vermont has a prosperous con economy. The governor's is Vermont has a growing economy because I think he'd say it has to grow before it's prosperous. And he has, uh, his, his second one is affordability. And the affordability one falls in very nicely under the economy about median house prices. It also falls in about healthcare, which, you know, how much do you have to pay on healthcare or percentage of your income for taxes? His third one is to support the most vulnerable. And so that falls into two, two of, um, or three actually, of the 10 outcomes that the legislature has. And his fourth one is modernization and efficiency. And that ties into also to one of the 10 outcomes. And I'll show you how that works later on. So when you get below the strategic plan, and the strategic plan should be driving what you're going to do in your programs. What programs, what are you gonna do in your programs or how are you gonna change your program to, to drive toward your outcome? And then uh, below that is our performance measures, which are the same as indicators, except at a lower level. We judge and measure how well we're meeting our outcome with indicators. For a program, we do it with performance measures. So for example, you have a training program. Your uh, result that you're looking to get is you want 80% of the people that enroll in the program to finish it. So that's uh, a performance measure. And of that 80% that finish it, you want 75% of them to actually, oh, I don't know, get a job. Let's say it's a, it's a workforce development program. So you want them to get a job. The mission of the program and the result that you want and you wanna be able to measure is not just that we have this training pro program and we push people through it. And great, you know, if you give me more money, I can have more people come to the program. Well, that's wonderful, but that's not what the program is really supposed to do. The program is supposed to help people get the trend, give them the skills so that they can get a job or a better job or a higher paying job. So you use performance measures to analyze whether your program is actually achieving what the legislature or the federal government gave you the money to do, for to do. It's not just to have a classroom and, and put people through it. It's so that they, A, graduate, and B, get a job out of what they've learned. So how do you know? In history, the state has been always great on giving metrics of how many. Well, we enrolled 50 people in our training program. Uh-huh. And, or our smoking cessation program, okay. At the end of the program, how many of them had actually quit smoking? And three months later, how many of them were still quit? It's not just to have, you know, people go through the class. I mean, men, people, and smoking cessation is one of those areas where they may have to take the class repeatedly to finally conquer that. And you can build that into the metrics to see whether you're actually being successful. The people that you have teaching the training class or the smoking sensation class, are they qualified? I mean, heck, you could have me teach the smoking sensation class, but A, I've never smoked. And B, I don't really know much about it. So I'm not sure how successful I'd be. My classes might not be very successful. So there are many ways to evaluate your program and how it's doing. Is it, is it doing good, well by the numbers? Is it doing well on a quality basis? Or is it actually doing what we really want, which is you're getting results that were intended. And once you get below performance measures, you're down to actual processes. And this is the process of writing 
and, and sending a contract around to get signed. How do we do that? How many hands does it have to go through? Does it really need seven signatures? I mean, literally we had, and I, the department will re remain nameless, but there was a big kerfuffle about how many people all went to some conference one year and the, and the secretary went a little mental and said, okay, that's it. Every expense report has to come to me. I have to prove everyone. So of course, all the directors and, and the commissioners didn't want expense reports going to the boss unless they'd seen it. And then all the supervisors. So literally there were seven people that looked at every expense report when we were still using paper expense report because of the fear factor. Well, we stopped that. First of all, we have an automatic system now and we found that some departments weren't using it. You guys use it for your, your expenses and they weren't using it. And why? Because it only allows for two signatures. So they weren't using it. Okay. Why do we hit you? Know, can you add signatures? No, we cannot add signatures. How about you don't need seven signatures? So you work through these problems with departments and challenges, and you come up with better ways to do it. And that's the process improvement. In the brackets next to each of those onion layers, you'll see a name of the tool or methodology that we use. And these are all improvement, continuous improvement processes. So we're trying not to be um, wed to RBA or lean or Hoshin Conry or a Six Sigma or Plan Do Study Act. We've developed a way to use the best part of each of those things at the place we need it. And we also feel that not saying, oh, you have to use RBA, oh, you have to use lean, also tells a better story because people get sort of tired and uh, resistant if you're trying to shove a particular methodology um, and particular language and all of that down their throats. They get tired of hearing, oh, that RBA stuff again, are you back again? That doesn't work, go away. So, We've tried to change that into what we call continuous improvement. So GAC gets involved at, well, at the level of one and two. And um, we're gonna go on and talk a little bit more about this. So how do we change an outcome or an indicator? Well, the outcomes are set in statute and they're in 3VSA 2311B. And they have to be changed with legislative action. And GAC uh, mostly does their meetings off session and, uh, and hear, you know, has hearings with departments and takes testimony. And um, if they want or find a reason to change an outcome or add one or split one in two, which we have done in the past uh, since 2013, they have to put it in a bill. And generally, GAC does a, you know, a maintenance, a, a kitchen sink bill every year to fix little things. And that would be where that would come out. And so that outcome change would have to go through both GovOps committees and would also have to go through the committee of jurisdiction. So if it were, um, you know, Vermont has a prosperous economy, it would have to come through your committee and to see if you like the way it's written? Do you think it's a valuable outcome? You know. Now, on the indicator side, the indicators are actually set by departments or me, or I've suggested by us, and GAC approves them, but they're not in statute. And the reason for that is sometimes we have to use an, uh, an indicator that's not our preferred indicator because we don't actually have the data for the preferred indicator. And so we may use something else in the meanwhile that's a close enough approximation. And it's one that we know has good data, comes out on a regular basis and is from a trusted source. 
those three things are all very important. For example, when we first started back in 2014, after, um, after Act 186 was passed, we had one in there for agriculture that was something about how much fruit and vegetables get sold every year. Well, we took that out after two years because come to find out, it's the feds that report that. Okay, so that's good, a, a reliable source, but it comes out every five years. And by the time they issue it after the fifth year, it's really partway through the sixth year. So what the heck does that tell you? Not much of anything. It's old. It doesn't mean, what are you going to do? How do you react to that? To five year, you know, essentially five year old information. So we took that out because it didn't really tell us anything. It didn't give us information to allow management or the legislature to decide we need to do something where things like unemployment rate that come out every month gives you the opportunity to see trends happening and to react. So indicators are a, uh, uh, not a legislative action, but they're a committee and administration action. And GAP will approve them. We've, we've had one swirling around for the last couple of years. If you look at poverty rate, there's, um, they use 185%, 200%, 300%, 400%. Well, what one are we supposed to use? Um, the feds generally for federal reporting use 185. So AHS would like us to use that, but lots of the, of the stakeholder community use 200. Now, in some ways it sort of doesn't matter whether you use 185 or 200 because the information comes from using the same metric over a period of time and seeing how the trends change. You're not going to see a much different trend line if you're looking at the population that's 185% uh, of the federal poverty level or a 200%. But it is nice if you are using a metric that everybody understands and uses. So that's some of the other work we do. So here's a chart I developed um, quite a while ago to show how both the legislative outcomes, which is to the left, 3 VSA 2311C, population level outcomes, Vermont has a prosperous economy, tie directly into, with the governors, the state strategic outcome, Vermont has a growing economy. And one of the metrics that we use on both is median house price. And median house price then feeds into, oh, missing an arrow, feeds into service domains for housing services. And at that level, there's a budget. There would be a budget that we could actually, if we can go across strata, we could give you a budget. Below that, you have the strategies that both the legislature and or the administration use for how you're going to affect median house prices, affordability of houses, or access to housing, or housing stock. And that is split by that dotted line. And so above the dotted line, which is half of the strategy and up, is the legislature, all your policies and statutes. Below that line is the administration. And so we're working on how do we implement those policies and statutes in our programs. And we have multiple programs in this case, these are just some of the programs we have that deal with housing. And each one of those programs has performance measures that tell you family supportive housing, how many of those people have supportive housing for six months. Transitional housing, how many transitional housing units do we have available for either people in economic transition or in uh, corrections transition, things like that. And all of those programs have budgets. That's the piece we'd like to get to so that the legislature and management can look at the family supportive housing program and see what it actually costs us, what it actually costs the taxpayer, and then look at the results and see if those mesh. Maybe it needs a bigger investment. 
maybe the investment is not getting the return that you want. Data is neither good nor bad. It's not meant to judge whether a program is doing well or not. It just gives you the information for you to evaluate. And we call those two levels above and below the dotted line. Above the dotted line are the population accountability, which is whole populations, either all Vermonters or all Chittenden County residents or all people with mental health issues or all uh, people that are being trained in workforce development. And below the dotted line is performance accountability. So how are we delivering service? Who are we delivering service to? And, and what are these things costing us? So we have something online called the outcome scorecard. And this essentially is the annual um, outcome report on the 10 indicators. And so I'm just showing you outcome one, what it looks like. We can actually look at this later. And we have under Vermont has a prosperous outcome, we have the percent or rate of 1,000 jobs of non-sector, and that's essentially the unemployment rate, the change in non-public sector employment, the, un the unemployment rate per 1,000 in the labor force, median household income, income, net change in jobs, net change in business establishments. Ooh, I'm not looking forward to seeing that one post-COVID. Uh, the gross state product, and I'm going to skip. Uh, the genuine progress indicator, because I'll talk about that, and then percent of population living at or below 185% of federal poverty. So obviously, the larger population you have living in poverty, the less um, a dynamic uh, your economy is, because it's pushing people into poverty. The genuine progress indicator was supported by uh, a number of legislators a few years ago, including Senator Polina, um, because it doesn't just measure the traditional gross state product uh, things. It also takes into account the effect on the economy of, of sort of uh, softer things like how much uh, recreational activity do you have, uh, how much you know forest or or, uh, or lakes or um, you know, things that are quality of life items and not just purely dollars and cents items. And uh, we were using that. It was done on a three-year rolling uh, basis, but the, the uh, professor at UVM who invented this and um, worked on it, and he would do it each year with a graduate student, died last year. Uh, pre-COVID, and no one has seen fit at UVM, uh, at the gun center, no one's really taken it over. So I'm not sure what the, um, what the future for that metric holds. Now, you notice there are little plus signs next to each of the yellow eyes, and now that's I for indicator, and the green O is for outcome. Now you, you can click on those and underneath that, you'll get a graph that plots the multiple years that we have that data for. And it also has some narrative sections uh, uh, that you can uh, click open and you can either read comments. Uh, some people write a lot, AHS really does a lot with their uh, outcomes and indicators. Um, and some people just write the bare minimum. But uh, you can keep drilling down to get more and more information about uh, and below indicator, then you can actually add programs. So under, um, you know, new change in jobs or, you know, new business establishments, ACCD has a program for assisting new businesses in either expanding or coming to Vermont. So you could have underneath that indicator, you could have those programs and see the metrics for them. So what am I trying to do here? Well, when I first came, first of all, uh, 15 years ago, we had no strategic plan. We had a budget and we had very little performance management. 
but rightfully, they should all be uh, part of the same circle. Uh, and your strategic plan should drive your budget. The things you're trying to do strategically, you should be funding. And then you determine how well you are using that money to get the outcomes you want and whether you're moving the needle on your strategic plan with performance management. So it should be a cycle uh, and it's slowly getting there. It was very disparate before, um, you know, previous governors, some of them have written strategic plans without any connection to what, um, what they were asking for uh, from the legislature in budgets. So I, how do you, how do you uh, drive a strategy forward if it's not funded? And then you expect that you're gonna magically get some kind of result. That's one of the reasons why strategic plans wind up being done and then they go sit on a shelf somewhere and nobody ever looks at it again. Everybody goes, oh, great job. We did a strategic plan. As a matter of fact, I just was on the phone earlier today with a woman uh, in Maine who's in the uh, University of Maine. She's doing her, her doctoral thesis and she's doing it on strategic planning. And so she interviewed me because Maine has a strategic plan, but they've been having trouble um, getting it off the ground. And so, so we, we went through a talk like this and you'll notice the things that the governor comes to you about almost always have to do with growing the economy, making Vermont more affordable, helping the most vulnerable and something having to do with making state government more efficient and, um, and effective. So he, um, you know, of course there's other things that he'll come to you with that right now, I mean, have a ton to do with our current pandemic state. But generally, if you look back over the things that the governor's proposed over the last four years, they, they pretty well revolve around his strategic outcome. And that's how he's trying to drive those strategic outcomes because you can't really implement a strategy if it isn't funded. So just to give you an idea of how and why um, indicators or performance measures are such challenges, this is the, the previously mentioned family supported housing. Um, so the, you've got the purpose of the program is to support families to secure housing and transition into permanent housing over time, blah, blah. Okay, so what do we do? And we have case co coordinating services and case management. We try to get them employment stability, financial stability, child safety, and family health and wellness. So here are 16 different performance measures that we could use and collect the data on and report on that all work to tell you if this family supported housing program is working. 16 is way too many. It would be a full-time job just to track this data. So one of our challenges with both performance measures and indicators is how do I decide which ones of those I should use? Okay, I could cheat and use the cherry picking ones that will make me look the best. I could, um, I could use the ones from, I could find ones from sources that I know will sort of lead the conclusions to the ideology I want. But neither of those things are really what, as the chief performance officer, I want. I want to use measures that come from a valid source. So if I'm not collecting it myself, I better be getting it from the federal government, the Annie E. Casey uh, organization, the Pew uh, Charitable Trust, you know, one of the real um, uh, uh, stalwart, noted, reliable producers of this data. If I can't produce it myself, then I have to get it from somewhere that I know are the census, you know, things like that. There are many <clears throat> measures you can find on the internet. You can go out and you can look. And lots of 
groups, support groups, advocacy groups, whatever, will use what we call composite metrics. So they will take several metrics of family supported housing and they will you know, use weighted averages to come up with this combined thing, which is fine if you, uh, if you understand and look at the pieces they're using. Because, for example, if I want to talk about how much it costs a family to live, you know, their rent, their taxes, their utilities, you know, do I put child care in or do I not put child care in? Is child care relevant to the majority of my population or not? Do I put health insurance in? Do I not? So there are ways that organizations who produce all these metrics and these things that you read and go online and you get newsletter. And I'm not gonna say they're jury rigging it, but what I am gonna say is, is that it's not a, it's not a straight on <clears throat> mathematic exercise because things are incorporated or left out to lead the reader to a certain conclusion. And we try very hard not to do that. We want the real data. And if we can't collect it ourselves, that's why we go to some place that has data that you can rely on, that hasn't been manipulated, that is always reliable, always current, timely, and available and accepted. <clears throat> so that's part of our challenge. Um, you know, people, when, when we meet, we're going to have a public meeting and then a meeting with um, stakeholders about the racial equity uh, indicators. And, you know, so I know we're going to get, somebody's going to want, well, I want, you know, Native Americans, uh, I want one indicator for them by themselves. You know, no, we're going to do this. We're going to do this as a totality. We're going to look at all of these groups together. And then we're going to say, OK, what's the unemployment rate, for example, among this group of Black, Indigenous, um, and people of color in Vermont compared to the aggregate statewide unemployment rate? And I want to see those two right together. I want to present them together. I don't want to take all the racial equity um, metrics and put them in their own section. I want to see the unemployment rate for BIPOC right next to the statewide everybody in, because I'm figuring it's going to be higher. I'm, I'm, I'm assuming here and, you know, bad on me, right? You know what they say about assuming. But the value in showing that has got to be how it compares to the aggregate. Not in and of itself. Okay, so let's say, so our unemployment rate right now is, you know, below 3%. So, so we're going to say, well, maybe the BIPOC unemployment rate is 5%. So if you just saw that 5% by itself, what does that tell you? It tells you it's 5%. It's about all it tells you. But if you see it next to the 2.8%, that is the state aggregate, it makes you ask questions. Why is it higher? What can we do if we want to bring it down and make it more in line with the, with the state average? That's what all of this is supposed to do. It's supposed to help you ask questions, lead you down the path to where you can actually look at what are we gonna do? What would you propose in economic development terms to bring down a rate of unemployment for a certain population of people that is higher than the aggregate. How do you make, how do you craft that legislation to hit that mark and not everybody? It doesn't hit everybody. I mean, it's kind of like all the coronavirus relief funds. Remember when it first came out and you have, you know, giant companies applying for the business loans and the little companies that it's supposed to go to, they didn't even get it out of the door. You know, they didn't even get to file the application before the money ran out because it wasn't crafted specifically enough to get it 
to the exact place that you wanted to get it. And I'm not blaming the federal government, but you know that's what happens when you do things in a week and a half, you know, instead of take six months to investigate it and take all the testimony. So it's a real challenge what metrics you use. It also does not help if you change metrics all the time because metrics are a point in time. It's what is it at the end of the year? It will only help you if you look at it over three or four years and, or three or four quarters or something and you can see where the trend is going. Again, if the trend is going up and that's a good thing, yay. If the trend is not going up and that's what we want, okay, why isn't it going up? Is it a specific area? Is it a specific population? Are, it, are they specific towns? You look at a lot of um, those indicators, we actually break them out by Chittenden County. We do the state and then I do Chittenden County and the rest of the counties lumped together. Because you look at the state, economic information with Chittenden in it looks fine. It's going up. Yeah, population going up, jobs are going up, wages are going up. You take Chittenden by itself and you take all the other counties in a lump and up oh, and look so good. Chittenden looks even better and the rest of it looks worse. And then if you actually look at it by county, you get two or three counties and you all know who they are, who are really hurting. So you've got your most populous economic engine driver county overshadowing all the information from the other counties. So if you just looked at that, you would think we're doing great. Yay, more housing, more jobs, higher level income, yay. You know, don't be going to Essex because it's not happening there. As a matter of fact, they're going in the opposite direction. So. That's what this, um, that's what makes this a challenge is finding the right metric, understanding what it tells you and using it consistently over a period of time so you can see what's happening. So that's the end of my lovely presentation. I have some contact information for you. If you'll notice the state transparency site, spotlight.vermont.gov is um, where you can find out a lot of information about my office and what we do. And I've given you the direct link, which is actually at Spotlight, it's on Spotlight, Vermont.grub for the scorecard. And I have my um, email address there. So if you have any questions after this, or you would like more information about something in particular, I'm happy to do that. One thing I would like to do, let's see if I can stop sharing is I want to show you the actual scorecard. Now, share screen. Okay, where is it? I know it's here someplace. Right. Let's see. Let's find out where it is. Okay. Ah, oh, it's, here we are. Let's see if we can, oh, I have an even better idea. Why don't I just go back? Okay, share. Let's see, let's go back to this. Share. Okay, so what are you looking at? Anything? Yeah, we can see your, uh, the scorecard. Yeah. Okay. okay, good. So if I open, you can, when you go to the scorecard, you can use this little blue thing here and open it all up. And, and you'll see that that will open as many layers as there are, or you could have um, open just if you're interested in um, median house price, you could just open that one. And in addition to the chart, which has all the um, you know, data points on it, you could also open the story behind the curve. So here, for example, is um, one of the ones that we do, the state in Chittenden. We actually don't do non-Chittenden, 
but I'll do another one. Let's see, unemployment rate is a better one to look at. So wow. here is the unemployment rate, okay, below 3%. Looks like we're doing great before COVID, but look at what the unemployment rate in Chittenden really is. It's 1.8%. The whole state is 2.4, but Chitton is 1.8 and non Chitton is 2.6. That's a big difference. And if you were to drill down into that non Chittenden even more, you would find that two of the counties are really in bad shape. Okay. So, you know, this is, this is where you will find your um, information that you can use then to say, okay, is 2.6% for the rest of the counties acceptable to us? If it's not, I mean, go back to 2015 and look where it was. 3.9% for non-Chittenden, 27 even back then, Chittenden was below 3%. And the state was at 3.6. So 2.7 to 3.9, that's pretty, pretty different. So you can see that Chittenden, by the virtue of its low rate and by virtue of its weight within the total of the state, how many people they have, it overshadows the state rate to tell a different story than if you just look at the state rate. So, you know, and things that you look at, I would, I don't know uh, if, if joint fiscal, you know, has the ability or you certainly can get this from things like this from the uh, Department of Labor, Labor from Matt Barowitz. But when you're looking at things and trying to think about how you want to help housing or how you want to help uh, employment or, or new businesses, take a look at it beyond just the state. Because it may change how you decide to direct your investment or how you decide to change regulations or whatever. And I'll give you a more informed picture about the economy and how these individual things are affected. Okay, so that's, um, you know, and so outcome two is um, Vermonters are healthy. And so this goes all the way down. It's got all 10 outcomes and each of the outcomes have indicators and each of the indicators you can open by clicking that little plus and you can read uh, information. You know, here's one of AHSs. They do a great job. They even give you other things to click on and go and go find out more information. They're our stars in this, frankly. And part of the reason for that is because Con Hogan started it there in the 90s and Doug Racine picked it up again and Governor Scott has pushed it forward. They have the most experience in using these kinds of metrics and have been doing it for many, many years. So for them, this is just built into how they run their business. For other agencies, um, not so much. It's for them, it's confusing and hard and extra work and whatever. Transportation is another one that does a really good job and ag to its credit has really adopted this and is really moving forward and so is education. They've even put a new uh, chief uh, data officer into education who is helping to corral all of the data. Education has masses of data because of all the federal programs and everything, but it's all over the place and you can't use it, you can't compare it. And so they actually have uh, Wendy Geller, who's their uh, director of, of data and is you know, trying to corral all this stuff and put it into one place where you can use it and compare it and, and make uh, you know, informed decision. So that's what I do. Um, does anybody have any questions? Because I'd be happy to answer any. Now that I've just talked, babbled away for however long. Michael. Thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed this presentation. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the areas that 
the public uh, sometimes have a, a dim view of is uh, accountability in, in government. And um, I, you know, when, when choosing KPIs, outcome measures um, uh, around issues that can be kind of a little harder to get your hands around, like well-being. Yes. Um, you know, obviously that's that's a challenge. I think that GPI measure you were talking about that, right. that might not be continuing right now. Uh, that you know was kind of driving towards some of that. I mean, are there times? Have there been times where there have been major policies or initiatives that really you never felt like we were able to get a a quality measure for? Right. So. That's where you have to use what we call proxy measures. So our Vermonters are healthy. There's no one metric I can give you that says what percentage of Vermonters are healthy. Okay, because it's, it's too complicated and it too many variables. So you have to pick the metrics that you have that have good data and you can get to easily and are, are updated all the time that are approximate, so hence the proxy. Um, so obesity, um, who has health care? Because we know people that have health care insurance, right? Who has health care insurance? Because people that have health care insurance are healthier than the same person with the same health conditions who doesn't have health care. So that's one. Now, people might, might say, well, what are you putting health insurance in there for? Well, because it's a big factor. It's a big factor, chronic disease, immunization. Oh, that one's, you know, has become an even more important one. So you try to find measures, not too many, you know, three to five, maybe seven. If you have 16, nobody's looking at them anymore. After they get about down to the third one, their eyes glaze over and they don't know what they're looking at. Even mine do. So it's that balance of trying to find, um, the right measures that broadcast what you're trying to say without having that one definitive, you know, measure, because it doesn't exist. You know, it, I mean, it just doesn't exist. So in transportation, what are you looking at? In transportation, you're looking at things like how many bridges have passed the, uh, you know, structural test how many um, new miles of paving have we done, right? Um, you know, di different things like that. In, in, uh, in uh, the in environmental, you know, phosphorus and Lake Champlain, hello, you know. Um, how many miles of river do we test or watershed do we test every year to, to, from the water basins that are going into Lake Champlain? Because it's not just the phosphorus in the lake. It's what's coming in every year from all these other places. I have to, I always have to tell this story when we were, when I was just starting with this and David Mears had just brought um, Lean into uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation. I had a meeting with him and he was already in the little conference room. And so I come walking in, he's just fin fin finishing an obviously difficult conversation and like sort of slams the phone and looks up at me, goes, they want me to get rid of phosphorus in the lake. Fine, I can get rid of phosphorus in the lake. Chuck has to get rid of all of the cows. <laughs> Chuck was the secretary of agriculture at the time, right? So, so you also have this going on, okay? We don't want all the cows to go away, but we want the lake cleaned up. Uh, you know, that's sort of a, a competing priority. So how do you deal with that? What's it worth to us? I mean. Is cleaning up the lake, and this is a rhetorical question, is cleaning up the lake more important than having cows? I mean, are we willing to sacrifice all of our dairies so that we can clean up the lake? Probably not. But on the other hand, we're also not willing to just have the cows, you know, doing their thing haphazard, unmanaged, to just keep continuing the problem of phosphorus in the lake. So what do you do? You know, so you have competing measures. Dairy's doing great. Yay, more poop. Water in the lake is getting dirtier. Not good, you know. Yeah. So it's a challenge. I hope, did that answer your question? Okay. Charlie? 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Sue. Your presentation is always very uh, wonderful. I really enjoy it. Uh, I'm wondering a couple things. Uh, and I think when you're describing the governor's priorities of now being a four-legged stool, and I think he probably does a good job of organizing the different programs he's uh, introducing to try to support his four different right. initiatives. The question is that our, our measurements are fixed in statute, as you said. So how often does the administration compare, mm -hmm. compare our level outcomes with what he's trying to, so it's the administration versus the legislature. So the measures are not fixed in statute. The indicators are, can change um, from year to year based on the decisions that GAC makes, but we try to keep them stable. But we have a strategic plan and we have some of the same metrics and other, if you just Google uh, Vermont strategic plan, you'll get it. Um, let me go see what the actual link is for that. La, 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 strategic plan. Um, so it is, yeah, strategic plan, one word, dot vermont.gov. Okay. So some of those are updated. Um, quarterly, some are annual, and we have um, our own indicators, if you will, for his outcomes. And we also have it by agency. Each agency has a strategic plan. Now, we uh, honestly, we never, we didn't promote this because it's, at, it's out there, it's public, anybody can find it, but it's, it's our guidepost. It's the governor's guidepost to how his cabinet is doing. Are we bending that curve? Because, you know, he came in under 631, you know, how many people uh, are, you know, we're losing population. We're the Your second oldest state in the system. nation. Yeah. Our schools have 20% capacity gap between, you know, we've lost 20% of our students over the past however many years. And, um, you know, at least at the time when he first came in, we were having almost one baby born a day that was um, addicted to drugs. So those were, um, you know, his areas of priority. And so his, um, he expects each of our agencies to be contributing to that in whatever way we can. Now you're gonna say, well, human resources, how can human resources, um, you know, connect to that. Well, human resources can make sure that the training we're giving our state employees is the best we can give them so that we are making them more valuable employees who are better able to do their jobs and do a better job of getting assistance to beneficiaries. So, you know, I mean, it's all, it's all a big swirling pot, right? So it's a big swirling yeah. pot of state government. And one of the major things that he's done is, is try to get the agencies and departments We're really, we've really gotten good at working together. Um, he, he'd been busting the, solo, the silos down like I've never seen before. And this is, you know, he's my third governor. So um, he puts, we have right now for COVID recovery, we have cross agency teams working on how, what do we got, you know, I'm on one um, headed by Secretary Young that has Secretary Flynn, Smith, and uh, Quinn, and some other people. What are we gonna do about all the employees and the state buildings when it's time to come back? What are we gonna do? We just gonna flip a switch? Are we gonna let some people continue to work remotely? What's our policy gonna be? How are we gonna deal with the fact that, you know, if we're bringing people back, there's still COVID, you know, I mean, are we gonna wait until next year when it's all gone? And what are we gonna do if it comes back in next November? So, and then they have an education team that are working on trying to figure out how are we gonna get schools back to quote normal, whatever that is. And how are we gonna deal with this issue that we've had where it's so inconsistent about which schools can provide remote learning and which schools haven't been able to and which students have access and which students don't have access. So we have, and then there's another group that's working on the economy. You know, how are we gonna help all these businesses that must just be hanging on, you know, by their fingernails? Um, 
And how are we going to take advantage of the fact that we seem to actually have an influx of people? I mean, one of the things the governor's been trying to do is how do you get people to move to Vermont? Well, I, you know, I hate to say it, but uh, just like Irene taught us, or Irene settled the 20 year discussion on whether we should build a new state hospital or not in one night. Um, you know, this has showed us that you can actually get people to move here. You have to provide them with Wi-Fi, you have, you know, and that doesn't necessarily mean we have to have IBM back, that they can come here and work their job remotely. Right. And that's what we're getting. I mean, look at the housing boom, you know, the house, houses are selling to out-of-state people the day they go on the listing, sight unseen. You know, so no. necessity, the mother of invention, the, the, the other question I have for you, and it's probably not a fair question, I apologize, on, on lean training. Yeah. There are some agencies that are known for being particularly difficult to navigate for Vermonters. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and particularly in this COVID crisis when many people filing various things. Uh, so wondering if, if your office gets involved with helping those uh, agencies or departments. Yeah, we actually had a, um, a particular program uh, that on, we have a project going for the last um, uh, couple of years, which is going to be uh, ramped up. You'll hear more about that. I'm not taking the governor's thunder away. Um, about um, one of the big frustrations of businesses is how to navigate the seven agency department permitting system. Um, we are. We just uh, finished one successfully about um, vendors who come into state buildings have to get processed for security by each department. So we've just pulled all of that together. Um, I believe there's there's probably a bill uh, in about language that gives BGS the authority to um, like do all the all the work with the vendors to get them authorized to come into a state building. Before, like the judiciary did their own and BGS did it, and but then corrections did each separate correction facility separately and then public safety. And so all of this is now is going to be a combined system. So if Joe the plumber gets approved to go into the Springfield prison, he's now approved to go into any building for a period of time before he then has to re, you know, reapply. And BGS is going to keep track of all that. So that's um, an example of, you know, how we do this. It takes a while. It's not instantaneous, but we do work through these things. Um, we did, you know, uh, DMV's done several. Um, one of the DMV ones that I love, which was early on, which was these um, motorboat permits that have, they're like, this shiny foily thing, right? Well, they kept running out of them because you have, because that special shiny foily thing, it's like special paper. So you have to order the special paper and then send it to the printer. And then when you're getting low and yep, someone asked the question in the meeting, why do we have that special shiny foily paper? Do we need that? Is that in statute? Well, of course it must be not. Regular coated paper is just fine. So it's it's things like that that seem, and that's mostly where the governor's program has been working, where I've been working, and and uh, Justin Kenny, who works for me, my my little genius, um, scratch the little, my genius, um, goes out and it just ch you challenge people. You know, why do we have that special tiny, shiny paper? Because somebody thought it 30 years ago, it was good stuff. You know, I mean, so is it in statute? Oh, statute says we have to publish in the so-and-so paper, which doesn't even exist anymore. Sure. Right? How many statutes say report, deliver a report to the legislature? Almost all of my reports now are electronic. And I send... You know, sometimes I send a PDF over, but basically I send the link. Here, look at it yourself. No, I'm not printing out 25 copies, three hole punched. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. 
So, um, so that's, that's where we use that a lot, you know, um, and they're just, you know, people are, well, where, where are you saving money? Well, I, you know, that's the really hard thing to calculate is how much, I can tell you how much money we save going from um, uh, uh, Citrix to, uh, to Teams, because that was a contract, okay? But I can't tell you how much I saved by making the department that had seven signatures for timesheets or expense report go away. What did it save? I mean, you know, six minutes a week for this person and an hour for that person. And so those are hard to get a hold of. But what you do have to say, what you're doing is you're building capacity in the department. So that if you've got a backlog, or backlog that just keeps building and you figure out how to deal with that, the department is not going to come to you and say, legislature, I need another person because we're backlogged. No, you're backlogged because you're inefficient. You're backlogged because you have seven freaking people signing this one piece of paper. You know, that's why you're backlogged. You're not, you don't have too much work. You're doing unnecessary work. So um, it's, uh, yeah, those are the things where I'm terrible because I my mother always told me I have a face like a plate glass window. So I have to work very hard to like keep that. We go into these things and people go, or like the comment when we were doing some work on permitting and we may, were making suggestions, someone says, oh yeah, we tried that in the 80s and it didn't work. <laughs> I have to go, mm. no. Because really I wanna go, excuse me? <laughs> hey, first of all, you've been here since the 80s, that's a problem. And B, <laughs> do you not think that with technology or information, no might have moved on a bit since 1980. You know? <laughs> but hey, you know, what do I know? So, mm -hmm. yeah. I just <laughs> yeah. yeah, it gets uh, yeah, pretty hard you know, sometimes to sit there and go, uh, I can hear my father going, there has to be a system, Susan. Yes, okay, thank you, Dad. Yeah, I just want to say that this has been really fun to listen to, and it has put a lot of things in perspective in the 12 years I've been here. I sat on a committee, which will not be named regarding a department or an agency or whatever it was that won't be named, but we brought in David Mears and the young lawyer, a couple of people from his office, a couple yeah. of, um, there was a young lawyer who was hired to deal with the backlog of appealed water permits or something, right. I don't, whatever right. it was. This poor girl looked at this pile of stuff and said, oh, yeah. you know, she, want, she thought she would retire and never get through the pile. And she put together, David had her put together a lean process mm -hmm. and that each one of those permits must have gone through up and down these lines of, right. um, you've seen the lean. And, and there I must can, have been 14 yeah. things that it had to go through before it finally got it to the decision point. And yeah. it was- well, and it we, was we actually did that great. with them. And one of the biggest problems was 75% of every permit that was mailed in because they couldn't do them online, was yeah. not filled out completely and had to go back. So this yeah. is what she sat there doing most of the day, open the mail, look at it, take an envelope, write it out, stuff it and send it back. Oh. Yeah. So you put them online, they cannot submit them without the information in the little boxes. Now yes. that's not to say that they may have the wrong information, but you know it got it down to where only 30% of them had to be sent back. And mm -hmm. And the error rate of incorrect information, um, you know, what we found, shh, don't tell anybody, but it, it became very clear that a lot of the engineering firms <clears throat> under pressure from their clients, they just send them in. And so they can say to the client, oh yeah, we sent it in, you know, and it's that damn department. <laughs> yeah, except for the thing came and it's only half filled out. Yeah, no, but this had had to go through approval yep. rating. Someone initialed yep. it and they sent it back yep. to the original one and right. he moved over to another person and they got it. It was, it was amazing to see. And it was, um, I always found that, that David did a remarkable job. I didn't know job. what yeah. the motivation, I mean, what yeah. the circumstances were, but he did a remarkable job with it. And I'm beginning to put all the pieces together. <laughs> yeah. And it's amazing. Some of the things that you, that you find it's, um, like I said, I have to like bite the inside of my cheeks, dig my nails and my palms because I just want to go, come on people. But it's, um, you know, and employees are just doing the job as they learned it. That's all. Mm -hmm. 
they're doing, they're working very hard and they're, they don't always know, and maybe they shouldn't know or should, whether this step is actually critical, but yeah. it's their job and they do it. Yeah. And until you can help them and the managers understand, and of course, that's where I have my biggest problem is what I call the frozen middle. The mm -hmm. employees are great. They all get it. They come to class. They love it. The cabinet's really super supportive, but in the middle is the supervisor who's like, I don't have time to do things right. Just get your work done, you know, yeah. <laughs> or oh, this is the flavor of the month, which is, you know, one of the things I battled for a long time. Um, and as soon as the next administration comes in, this will all go away. So I'm not going to do it. Mm -hmm. Hence why I said to the governor, you better be giving me six years here because <laughs> <laughs> otherwise I'm not going to do this again. <laughs> so, um, Thank you. That was a really well done explanation of how the thing is supposed to work. It's one of the best explanations I've heard. Thank yeah. you. And it's really interesting when you um, realize that there are some really simple ways, and that's something COVID has really done for us. You can file things online. Oh my God. You can have meetings online. Oh my. You know, you can share documents in SharePoint. We have SharePoint, we have Microsoft SharePoint. So so five people can be in the same document at the same time editing it, and it keeps track of all of that, and it tells each of you, oh, you and Bob are trying to change that same line, so you can send a little message electronically to Bob going, Bob, what are you doing? So, I mean, all of this technology is there. It takes money, and it takes some um, planning to institutionalize it, but it is amazing how much more efficient and confident you can you can be um, about what you're what you're doing. Um, you know, look at all the doctors that now do telemedicine because they had to. And labor, I mean, you know, that damn system in labor, it's been there for 30 years. The feds built it 30 years ago. And all it can do is pay unemployment. And the only thing you can do is change the rate. So come in and say, now I have to give a flat amount to everybody and not a calculation, wah, you know, can't do it, can't do it. And we have 200 people on the phone lines because there was no way to do online. I mean, all of that's, you know, been worked on and being changed now because we had to. So uh, there's a great line that Sean Connery says at the end of um, The Hunt for Red October, if anybody's ever watched that movie, and he, uh, he says at the end to Jack Ryan, you know, a little revolution is good for the, for the country or for the world every once in a while. And although this isn't a revolution, it's like these crises, as painful as they are, do lead to some really innovative changes that you would never have gotten to. You would never have done because you weren't being forced to. So thank you. It's been a pleasure. Please feel free to email me. Certainly will, Sue. This has been excellent. Um, great. Been a great conversation. Um, as I was looking at the uh, um, at the outcomes and looking at the economy, and yeah. I'm just thinking, you know, what's missing there? Right. And, you know, there are things that are missing. It's you know, our workforce continues to contract. That's correct. And so how, how is that affecting our prosperity? Well, you, if you go to the strategic plan, you'll find one of the metrics we have there is um, the workforce by county. And that's a really um, a sad chart. Yeah, I think it's a bit, that, that's a big eye opener. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sad. It makes me sad, you know, even though I try to be, agnostic about the numbers, the numbers are what the numbers are. You know, they tell a story and it's it's sad sometimes to look at what the numbers say because you know that these are people. They're well, my, definitely. you know, people in this town, people in other towns. I may not know them, but they're all Vermont people. And, and you, you know, you, it's hard to keep that, um, acknowledgement out you know that rat go holy crow you know look at all the people in whatever county that 
how many fewer people there are and how many are on uh, are out of work or yep so yeah. um yeah i would encourage you to go there too to get Certainly. some more economic metrics yeah. um i'm happy to send you the link again if you would like by email or it's on the presentation so feel free i think we're good plan.vermont.gov right yep yeah. that's right yep. okay okay this has thank been great. Thank you very much. Sue, Appreciate thank you. It. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. Committee, thank you very much for another good week, I think. Um, I think today was very informative from everybody that we saw and talked to, and um, I think a, a good week overall. Um, we'll uh, try to finish up the agenda so Amy can get it out to everybody tonight.